I will awaken the dawn as my prayer ascends to you. Well, welcome to the Journey Church this morning. We're glad that you're here to worship with us. We are currently in a sermon series in the book of Psalms. We're walking through selected Psalms, looking for how people walked with the Lord and how the Lord walked with people. The Psalms clearly show us how the Lord wants to help us in our time of need. So on our next slide, you'll see the title of our sermon series in Psalms. Take the path of Psalms for protection, provision, and power. On our next slide, you'll see today's sermon title and passage. When you are in trouble, the Lord is listening. When you are in trouble, the Lord is listening. We'll be in Psalm 20, verses 1 through 9. If you will, please take your Bibles and open them to Psalms chapter 20. And we'll begin in verse 1. If you did not bring a Bible with you today, we have the passage up on the screens for you. This psalm is a prayer for victory over enemies. It is a psalm that David wrote as he was facing a very tough enemy. Listen to David's heart in this psalm. David declares two things. David declares his confidence in God's protection and in God's provision. Psalm chapter 20 verses 1 through 9 and I'll be reading out of the NASB version. Verse 1. May the Lord answer you in the day of trouble! Exclamation point. May the name of the God of Jacob set you securely on high. May He send you help from the sanctuary and support you from Zion. May He remember all your meal offerings and find your burnt offering acceptable. May He grant you your heart's desire and fulfill all your counsel. We will sing for joy over your victory. And in the name of our God, we will set up our banners. May the Lord fulfill all your petitions. Now I know that the Lord saves His anointed. He will answer Him from His holy heaven with the saving strength of His right hand. Some boast in chariots and some in horses, but we will boast in the name of the Lord our God. They have bound down and fallen, but we have risen and stood upright. Save, O Lord. May the King answer us in the day we call. Wow. What confidence David has in the Lord God. Do you have that kind of confidence in the Lord as you live your life or as you pray? If so, that's great. If not, why not? I want to live my life like King David. I want to live my life in prayer like King David. On our next slide, you'll see verses 1 through 4 listed for you. I have changed the color of the sentences and underlined some of the sentences to make clear some of the intended emphasis. There are eight things that David says that he hopes the Lord will do in a believer's life. Let's look at them and see exactly what we need today. May the Lord answer you in the day of trouble. May the name of the God of Jacob set you securely on high. May He send you help from the sanctuary and support you from Zion. May He remember all your meal offerings and find your burnt offering acceptable. May He grant you your heart's desire and fulfill all your counsel. Let me ask you a question. Today as we read the Old Testament and we are New Testament believers, do you need the Lord God in heaven to, one, answer you? Number two, set you securely on high? Number three, to send you help? Do you need the Lord God in heaven to support you? Number five, do you need the Lord God to remember your worship and service to Him? Remember, we do not offer meal offerings and burnt offerings any longer because Jesus Christ is the offering. He died on the cross for our sins. He is our offering to God on our behalf. But we offer the sacrifice of praise, the sacrifice of worship and service with our spiritual gifts and obedience to God through Jesus Christ. 
Number six, do you need the Lord God to grant you your heart's desire? Number seven, do you need the Lord God to fulfill all of your counsel, which means to fulfill all of your purpose? Does God need to fulfill your purpose? I know for a fact that I strongly desire for the Lord God to do each and every one of these things in my life every single day. Do you need the Lord to protect you from enemies? To provide work for you? To provide income for you and your family as you pay your bills? Do you need the Lord God to help you in your marriage? Do you need Him to help you raise your children? Do you need the Lord God to help you and protect and provide for your health, etc., etc., etc.? Do you need that? I know I do. How does David believe all of this is going to happen? In the Hebrew and Jewish culture, they believed strongly in names. What a person's name was and what it represented was of great importance and great significance. But it was not only the name of people that was important, but also the name of God that was extremely important. On our next slide, you'll see Psalm 20, verses 1 and 5 and 7. I'll read these to you. These verses focus on the name of God. In three verses out of these nine, in this one chapter, David's focusing on the name of God. He's not just calling out to God in prayer, like you and I might do. He's calling out and depending, actually depending upon the name of God that it means something so significant that his name will bring about those things we've just talked about. Psalm chapter 20, verse 1 is this out of the NASB. Verse 1, May the Lord answer you in the day of trouble. May the name of the God of Jacob set you securely on high. He didn't just say, May God, the God of Jacob, set you securely on high. May the name of the God of Jacob set you securely on high. Verse 5, We will sing for joy over your victory, and in the name of our God we will set up our banners. May the Lord fulfill all of your petitions. Verse 7, some boast in chariots and some in horses, but we will boast in the name of the Lord our God. He didn't just say we will boast in the Lord. We will boast in the name of the Lord our God. You know, we do not take the name of the Lord God as seriously today as believers did in the past. Just think with me for a moment about how we flippantly toss around God's holy name. Many of us, and I know some believers that do this too, many times we take his holy and blessed name in vain. Have you ever thought about how our culture takes God's name in vain by saying GD? And maybe using Jesus Christ as a frustrated term for maybe when you drop something heavy on your toe? We don't say, oh Timmy! Oh, Steve. Oh, Bobby. It's always, oh, Jesus Christ. Why would we do that? Satan very clearly wants people to use the very name of God in a very unholy way. He's not worried about you using somebody else's name in an unholy way. You're already a sinner and unholy anyway. But the Holy One of God is the one that he hates. And if he can have you... In a flippant moment, or a frustrated or angry moment, use the holy and blessed name of God in a very light and vain way. He'll do it. But I don't even think we get it. Some people that actually would use terminology like this, actually pray and ask God to bless them. How can a person expect the Lord to bless them when they take His name in vain? On our next slide, you will see how the author of the book of Hebrews in the New Testament saw the most holy and, listen, excellent name of God. Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 through 5a in the NASB. God, after he spoke long ago to the fathers in the prophets in many portions and in many ways, in these last days has spoken to us in his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the world. And he is the radiance of his glory and the exact representation of his nature and upholds all things by the word of his power. 
When he had made purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Having become as much better than the angels as he has inherited a more excellent name than they. Who's the they? For to which of the angels did he ever say, You are my son. Today I have begotten you. You know, it's an incredible thing to be an angel. Woo, if we were to really see an angel in person. Now, we see people in the Old Testament that have seen angels in person. Even some people in the New Testament. To see an angel is quite amazing. But no angel has ever heard from the Father's lips... You are my son. Oh, you're my creation. I made you. But no angel has ever heard you're my son. And no angel has ever heard the father say, you are called Jesus. On our next slide, we will see the passage of Philippians chapter 2, verses 9 through 13. Again, I'll be in the NASB. For this reason also, God highly exalted him, meaning Jesus, and bestowed on him the name which is above every name, so that the name of Jesus, every knee will bow of those that are in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. So then, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now as much more in my absence, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who is at work in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. There are 7 billion people alive on the planet right now. That does not take into account who went before us. Millions before Seven billion now, and if Jesus tarries, there's more babies being born every day in hospitals around our world. Seven billion alive now. The previous ones, the current people alive today, those that may come if Jesus tarries, every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. There is no other name greater than His. Not Buddha. Not Allah, not Muhammad, not Joseph Smith, not Bruce White, not President Obama. Nobody's name is above the name of Jesus. So when David's praying back in the Old Testament, he didn't know of the name Jesus. He knew of Yahweh. He knew of I am. He knew of the God of Jacob, of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He knew what God had been called, even God Almighty. He knew of the names that God had revealed of himself at his point in time. What David is saying in verses 1, 5, and 7 when he says, It's the name of God that I depend upon when I'm in trouble and I need help. The name of God meant something special to David. And we even see the New Testament authors, not just the author of Hebrews, but other authors that talk about the name of God, the most excellent name of God, the glory in the name of God. So when you pray, you're not just praying to somebody. You're not just praying to a God. You are praying to the only true living God and His name is Holy. And blessed and majestic and full of splendor and exalted. And by the way, did you see that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord? That's not just the believers. Did you know angels bow before the throne? Angels and men, just mere creations, bow at the name that is above every name, the Lord Jesus Christ alone. On our next slide, you'll see verses 8 and 9. Psalm 20, verses 8 and 9. Now, when it says they have bowed down and fallen, David is talking about his enemies. They have bowed down and fallen, meaning those that are not living right or they're living unrighteously. But we, the ones that are living righteously and holy, we have risen and stood upright. 
Meaning we are living righteously in God during our difficult time. Save, O Lord, the King. Answer us in the day we call. We get a very good glimpse into David's life here. We get to see just what kind of man David is and how he thinks as a man and as a believer and as a king. David is the king over all of Israel. There's nobody within the sound of my voice that I know of that has been a king. And that you've been over a kingdom. And that you have ruled. And that people bow before you when you walk into a room. Dave is the king. David is the kingdom over all of Israel. David is used to how a king is treated. People constantly bowed before David as king. Anytime he went anywhere, people would fall flat of their face and bow before the king of Israel. So he was used to people bowing before him. So he understood what it was about to be an earthly king and have ultimate power. David recognized, though, very importantly, that the Lord was the heavenly king. So we have the Israelite king, little K, King David, calling on the heavenly king, big K, the Lord God, to answer his prayer in Psalm 20, to bring victory to him and to his people, the Israelites that lived in Jerusalem. And with that very humble attitude, do you think that the Lord answered David's prayers in his days of trouble? He absolutely did. On our next slide, you will see that we are going to partake of the Lord's Supper today. As we celebrate July 4th weekend, celebrating our national freedom, it is also very wise that we turn our hearts and our minds towards celebrating our spiritual freedom that we have only because Jesus Christ, the King, who is the King of all kings. We have a lot of kings around our world. We don't have a king here. We have a president. But all around the world, you either have a king, or you have a president, or you have a queen. But you still have somebody that's an authority. Jesus is the king of kings. The Lord of lords. And that king judges righteously. He came here and died for everyone I'm looking at in this congregation and those that are viewing by video. He came here as a king who's used to being bowed to, came here and he got on his knees and he humbled himself and washed our dirty feet and took the penalty for our sins. That said, we're going to look at Luke 22 as we move into our Lord's Supper time. Gentlemen, come forward. If you have your Bible, these are not going to be on the screen for you. If you have your Bible, you can turn to Luke 22 or you can just listen carefully. I want us to really consider carefully before we partake of the Lord's Supper this morning. And gentlemen, as you go down the aisles, remember the camera. Try to stay to the sides. As we worship this morning through the Lord's Supper, we have two requirements in 1 Corinthians that we need to make sure that we don't forget. Number one, the Lord's Supper is only for a believer. It is only for a Christian to eat of the Lord's elements, his body and his blood, and not be his child. There are consequences, according to 1 Corinthians. Number two, you need to be living according to the Lord. If you are blatantly living against the Lord Jesus Christ, I highly encourage you, let it pass. Let it pass. Sit there and pray and get your life right with God. And then partake of the elements the next time you have that opportunity. But you need to be a believer. You need to be his child. And you need to be living according to his grace and his righteousness. Amen? Now, you do not have to be a member of this church to participate in the Lord's Supper. You can be a visitor. You can be a member. That's nothing in the scriptures about that. If you are a believer and you're living under the Lord, please, you are welcome to participate of the Lord's Supper with our church family. I'm going to walk through Luke 22 verses 14 down to 20 and I want to point out one thing about the king and his kingdom. When the hour had come he reclined at the table and the apostles with him and he said to them I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer but I say to you I shall never again eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Who rules over a kingdom? The king. The king looked at the people and said, I will no longer participate of the elements of my supper 
until we are reunited in heaven and we take it as one large family. Think about that and also think about whatever sins are going on in your life right now. How are you living your life in such a way that's not glorifying God? Christians and Christian churches have to look at our lives and our witness. How are we living? Is there any remorse in our lives today? Do you come to church week after week after week and yet you're not sensing that there's anything I need to ask God to forgive me for? Do you know what is really going on in a person's life when we don't show remorse? It's called hard-heartedness. We're hard-hearted. And we're okay with what's happening. We don't really want to give God that area of my life. So as these men come now and they start to bring around the elements to you, I pray that you will think about it and say, Lord, I'm not just taking part of these elements because I'm a Christian. I'm partaking of these elements because I'm a Christian and I'm living unto you. So right now, while our worship leader plays music, I want you to just pray. Bow your head, pray, and talk to the Lord in heaven. Talk to him. Bless his name. Tell him what he means to you. Have a conversation with him in silent prayer as David did. And confess whatever you need to confess to him. Rejoice in him whatever you need to rejoice in him. Ask petitions of him of whatever you need to ask of him. But whatever you do, make it a time where you're sincere about what's in here. Give it to God. And I promise you the Lord's table, the Lord's supper will truly be something of a blessing in your life. Just pray and seek the face of your Savior in heaven today as they sing. As we go back into our passage, we're in Luke 22, 19 and 20. And when he had taken some of the bread and given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them saying, This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he took the cup after they had eaten, saying, This cup which is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. You know, the king, Jesus, was put on a cross. And you know what's very interesting is that the only name that they put above Jesus on the cross was not Lord, was not God, was not master, was not teacher. The only word they put up there was king of the Jews. The king over his kingdom gave his life for those in his kingdom. What we really need to focus on, church family, is that we need to live holy lives to God. There's not a person probably here that doesn't pray for God to bless you. God bless me. Did you know that God wants you to live righteously and holy unto him? And he will bless you. And he will bless me. Most of the reason we are not blessed as Christians and as a Christian church and as a Christian country, we're not living in such a way that he would bless it. If your children are not living in a way that they should in your home, are you blessing them? No, you're disciplining them. And then by the discipline, you want them to grow into holy boys and girls. We are children of God if we're believers. We need to focus on what the king has said. We're in his kingdom. Oh, we're in the kingdom of America and we have a president. That's our national kingdom. But did you know the spiritual king, Jesus Christ, is over his kingdom? And if you're a Christian, you're in his kingdom now. We need to be focusing on his sovereignty in his kingdom. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are still so thankful for the Lord's Supper these 2,000 years since the death and burial and resurrection of your son. We lift up your holy name today. Lord, I pray that I and all of the Christian family known as the Journey Church will live holy, righteous lives. Help our lives to have impact in our communities, in our city, in the metroplex, in the state of Texas, and even in the United States of America. Help this little church to have a powerful impact. It will only come by us living righteously before you. And I pray that you'd put your divine hand upon us. And Lord, as we are struggling, please help us. Please help us with whatever we're struggling in. And we ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. 
I want to close with this today. Remember our sermon title? Are you in trouble today? Are you in trouble today? The Lord is listening. Are you in trouble today? The Lord is listening. This invitation time is for you. You can come down and you can kneel at the altar and you can pray. You can come down here and talk to me and we can pray together. Or you can pray standing where you're seated. But whatever you do, seek the Lord. Sing these songs today as we go out, knowing that you really mean business with God. Every individual Christian can make an incredible spiritual impact if we only would. Don't just sing it because you know the melody. Sing it because it's what's in your heart and it's what your hearts desire. Let's stand and let's worship Christ.